tried to do through the course of, of raising our girls uh, is we tried really, really hard to eat supper together every day. Uh, and that was not easy. Some of you that are young people, you know what happens in the afternoon with athletics and, and uh, drama stuff and all those kind of things like that. Sometimes it was really hard. Sometimes our girls were not all that excited about ha being, ha being limited to actually sit down with us. But one of the reasons why we did that is we actually just wanted to put our eyes on them. We wanted to see uh, their countenance. We wanted to look at them personally. We wanted to see how they were doing. We wanted to catch them at the end of their school day. Rana often had to brief them uh, when she got home. But something about, as a pastor, I miss seeing people face to face. Uh, it's hard to know what's happening in people's lives when you can't look at them and you can't see them. And sometimes you know yourself, the people that you know, uh, you, you know something's wrong first by their posture and their facial expression before you ever know anything really that's going on. And so uh, I, pr I, I encourage you as, as members here at Emmanuel to be praying for one another. I encourage you to take opportunities to put your eyes on each other. And I really want to encourage you, as soon as you feel capable, to gather with us together so that we can see and be seen uh, and love each other in that way. Well, today we're going to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, so I'd like you to turn there in preparation for what we're going to be doing today. It's not going to be an unfamiliar passage to you, uh, but I want to talk to you today about how the storyline of the Bible comes to a conclusion. Now, throughout this year, uh, whoops, I always forget to turn this thing on. I don't turn it on early so that I don't uh, accidentally take over the PowerPoint while you're singing your song, that's one, so then I forget to turn it on. Uh, as we've come through this year, we've talked about a number of things, right? So it's a, a year-long, probably the longest series, I think, that we've ever had at Emmanuel. Uh, and so we've talked about things like the triune God, um, three persons, one God. We've talked about what God's up to. Uh, we've looked at what the Bible has to say on what it means to be human, such a very important uh, issue today. Uh, just listening to one of the cultural movers and shakers, one of the constant lies that under, one of the constant... Uh, uh, falsehoods that underlies many utopian visions of humanity is that humans can be perfected through social action and through effort. And so every one of those utopian efforts, right, uh, suggests that if we just treated people appropriately, if we had the right social structures in place, uh, if we took certain things out of society, then people are perfectible because they're inherently good. Well, every time you hear a utopian vision like that, what usually follows is a lot of dead bodies behind it. That's what's happened in every communist government, what's happened in every utopic vision, because human beings are not perfectible, according to the Bible, because we're all fallen and broken. We need to be redeemed and reclaimed, right? So that's why different systems have always put in place, they, if, if they've been based on a Judeo-Christian ethic, they deal with the idea that people are inherently fallen and sinful and not perfective, perfectible, so you put checks and balances in place because you know people are going to be evil, right? So the realism of that, and so the issues here, uh, we've learned about what it means to be human, so we've talked about that. We've learned about what's wrong with us, and what's really wrong with us isn't merely societal factors, it isn't uh, physical ailments, it isn't those, it's inherently an estrangement from God that's called sin. Right? And, and it's not just that we're broken, which is the effect of sin, that we're actually rebels and therefore we're broken. We're not broken and become rebels, but we're rebels and we become broken as a consequence of our rebellion against God. Right? We sung about that a little bit earlier. We talked about what God has done to step into the mess that we've created. We talked about the whole teaching of Scripture about salvation centered in the work of Jesus Christ, made effective by the Spirit. So we talked about that. And then most recently, we've talked about the church. We've talked about uh, what God says about this group of people. Who's the church? What's the church supposed to be doing? What's its purpose? Who makes up the church? How does it organize itself? Right, as we've dealt with that. Now, what we've done, and as we started this way back in the beginning, right, we have been focusing on absolutes, right? What, must be accept, what we must accept to be saved and whose acceptance should follow salvation, Right? So the absolutes are the clear teaching of Scripture that teaches us about who we are, who God is, what He's up to, how we relate to Him, uh, and these are the types of things that we need to know initially to be in a right relationship with God, but also a, a mature Christian as they grow will come to believe these truths that are taught in Scripture. 
convictions are ones that we talked about, in particular with a part of our series on ecclesiology. Well, why are we Baptists, or why would we identify ourselves historically with Baptists? Well, there's certain convictions that are putting together the teaching of Scripture as it seems to imply and direct us to suggest that we should order ourselves in a particular way and think of ourselves as particular people. So, for example, when it comes to denominational distinctives, you don't have priests at Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, who are the conduits through which everything that you need to know from God comes to you, right? In the ancient church before the Reformation, you went to the church and the priest was the one that mediated God to you. You didn't even have a copy of scriptures. You couldn't even read them because you couldn't afford them or have them. And they were in Latin, by the way, so you couldn't read them even if you had one. And so the priest was the one who mediated God's presence and blessing to you and teaching to you. You yourself didn't have any responsibility for interpreting the scriptures or knowing the scriptures or following them on your own. So we believe in the priesthood of the believer, which is that you have the capability and the responsibility before God to understand your scriptures. And so we're in a tradition of people that tried to put the scriptures in the language of the people so they could read it. That's why our Bibles aren't still in Latin, right, or some other language that's agreed upon. No, they're in English and Spanish and uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, Nigerian and everything else all around the globe, right, because we want it in the hands of the people because each person is responsible to read, understand, follow, and proclaim, right, in terms of that. So that's one of our denominational distinctives about our tradition, the priesthood of the believer. Well, those are convictions that we have, and those are important implications for how we shape our body together. That's why I'm a pastor, an elder, a shepherd, and I'm not a priest here, and that's why we don't have priests and we don't have people. And that's also why it's incumbent upon us to to disciple you as people because we believe the church is a group of people that acts together. And so when a church has to discipline one of its members, the whole church has to be involved, not just the pastors, right? And when the church chooses its pastors, it needs to be a choice that's involved by every member. It's not some distant council. It's not a group of elite Christians, right? Those kinds of things. So all of those fit in, but those have real ramifications for how we organize ourselves and understand ourselves. So that's the denominational. On the outside of that, are wisdom issues where Christians differ, and those are clearly among us, right? Uh, what is an extravagant lifestyle that Scripture uh, warns against? Don't be extravagant. Don't live an extravagant lifestyle. Well, you ask, you know, 100 Christians, you'll get 100 different definitions, right, in terms of that. Should you buy something really quality and keep it for all your life, or should you buy something cheap, right? So I have people that get really upset about all those things. Okay? There's tons of wisdom issues, and that's where we've got a lot of questions even in our political arena right now. And then on the outside are questions, things that are unsettled issues, things that uh, questions that are left out that Scripture doesn't speak on extensively. Right? Jesus says things like this when he's talking to the Pharisees, and they're asking him about this woman who she's going to be married to. She had seven husbands, and now she's going to die. And they say, well, Jesus, who is she going to be married to in the resurrection when everything is put together? And Jesus says, well, that's not an issue because there's not going to be marriage nor giving in marriage. Well, that's the only statement that Jesus makes about male-female relationships when everything's righted. Well, and there's lots of people who say, well, what does that mean? What does it exactly mean about heavenly existence? Well, Jesus doesn't go on to say anything else, right? So you can infer, so, but if you get somebody who says the most important thing in the Bible is Jesus' teaching on male-female relationships in the resurrection, uh, no, Right? No, that's not that important. And two, don't make it divisive. And three, it maybe is a good topic to have among theology students to talk about, but let's not waste our time and cloud the people of God on trying to go after something. Paul has a word for those. He calls them matai logos, battles about words, because that's all they are, because we're not talking about realities. Okay? So those are the kind of things we've been talking about. Now here, as we come to this section on eschatology, we've kind of followed within this section called absolutes, there's a core of things that you must believe to be saved, right? So it's clear in Scripture to believe to become a Christian, you have to accept the fact that you're a sinner because you're turning to Jesus to save you from the sin that you have committed against God, okay? So salvation, you can't understand salvation without sin. Salvation isn't something he just drops on you and rewards you for your good efforts, now, he gives it to you when you cry out to him as someone who's bankrupt and a rebel, and you put down your arms, you say, God, do for me what I can't do for myself, and I believe that Jesus is the one who came to die for me and take what was mine. 
I believe Jesus came and raised from the dead and earned for me what I could not earn for myself. I put my trust in him and him alone, right? You have to know that to know Jesus. Now, you can know all kinds of things about church. You can know all kinds of things about religious people, but that's the core issue. If you're here today at Emmanuel and that decision you haven't made, all the rest of the stuff is dressing, okay? So core issue. Then around that, we listed a number of other things, things that we must not reject. The nature of God is triune. And we talked about this. This is why there's a, we have a problem with the Church of Latter-day Saints because they do not believe that God is triune. They misrepresent the God of the Bible. And if you get God wrong, you get everything wrong. Okay? So cru crucial issue, Trinity, right? The deity and humanity of Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't, wasn't just God. He wasn't just man. He was the God-man. And both of those are absolutely crucial. Right? In the teaching of Scripture, if he wasn't God, he couldn't actually affect our salvation. But if he wasn't human, we didn't have anybody to stand in our place and take for us what we deserve. So he has to be fully human, has to be fully God, or we have no Savior and we're dead in our, our, our sin. Crucial issue, right? Here, the part here is what we're going to hit on today, the historical truth and significance of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and coming. Now we're going to deal with the implications of his resurrection, and we're going to be talking about his future coming, right? That's the storyline. And then on this outer circle, right, we're going to be talking about the consummation of the biblical storyline, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. So what we're looking for, and as we talk about eschatology, the doctrine of last things, we're really talking about the culmination of the whole biblical storyline, the consummation of all of God's promises to redeem and reclaim everything that's against him. So here's a definition of eschatology, not the only one that you will find, uh, but here it is, the study of what God, and I just wanted to qualify this, if you don't know where this phrase, these three phrases come from here, at the end in Romans chapter 11, after Paul has contemplated God's sovereignty in his work in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he ends where anyone who rightfully understands the greatness and grandeur and mercy of God ends, he ends with doxology. Right? He says, who's ever been a counselor that God needed advice from him? Well, no. Who's ever put God in his debt that God needs to repay him? Well, no one. Right? And then he ends with this just before he ascribes praise to the Lord at the end of chapter 11, and he says, from him, from God, everything that exists was brought into existence by God's sovereign act. Through him, everything that continues to exist exists because God sustains it. You breathe, I breathe, we walk and live and move and have our very existence because God says it's going to happen today. And there'll be one day that he'll look at me or you or the people in your life and he'll say, your time on earth is over. So we even celebrate that and sing about that, that difficult that God gives and he takes away. He gives life and he ends life. And so even embedded in our whole Christian ethic is that it's only God's right to determine life. We don't get to take it, right? Whether somebody else takes it from me or whether I take it from myself, that's outside of re remembering that I'm submitted to God. He is the God of life and death. So from him, through him, and to him, and so everything is heading toward the goal for which God has made it, right? So crucial. He's in sovereignly in control of directing things toward the goal for which he has made those things. Well, that God is a God who has the right and authority to speak on these issues, right? So he's the one that will tell us what will happen in the future to every individual. It's often referred to as personal eschatology. What's going to happen to every person in the end? And what's going to happen to everything, right? Sometimes called general eschatology or cosmic eschatology. And so as you read, God isn't just about rescuing you or rescuing us. He's going to eventually reclaim everything that's been impacted by our sin. And so the storyline ends with what? A new heavens and a new earth occupied by fully reclaimed people who fully restored to everything that they've been created to enjoy, enjoying intimate relationship with God forever. Okay? So when we're talking about that, these are the things. So we're going to work through, over the next couple weeks, we're going to work through the major events that Scripture seems to lay out in terms of these final days. Now, though many fret, right, or simply don't want to think about what the future holds for them personally, right? Every time I think about this, every time I do a funeral, 
I'm praying that God would help people to think seriously about death. All right? The writer of Ecclesiastes is famous for his little statement. He says, the house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. And he says the house of mourning is better because it forces you to come face to face with your mortality, with the brevity, with the fragility of life. Right? And we live in a culture where people just, I don't want to think about that. But some people fret over it when their mind drifts to the end, what the future will hold for them personally. And then we live in a moment where people fear things like the effects of the climate and they fret over the future of the planet. Right? And people live in fear. The Amazon commercials that I see where there's this dad who's a faithful eco-warrior and he's saving the planet for the next generation to come, right? And so his life has meaning and purpose because he's trying to fight against an apocalyptic vision of what's going to happen to the world that gives meaning and purpose. Now, I'm not about destroying the earth or raping the earth or treating it in an inappropriate way. A Christian should think carefully about stewarding God's creation, But the idea that life is reduced to me saving a globe so that other people can enjoy it when I know that my life is going to end up as a pile of dirt that no one will ever remember me a hundred years from now. Is that really what life is about? But people fret over that. So what we have here, God has revealed through his authorized agents in Scripture what the future holds for everyone and everything. And as the creator God who brought it all into existence, he has the authority and right to speak on these issues. Okay? So... If I say here, in broad strokes, right, about the Scriptures, okay, what he tells us is that he is at work through Jesus by the power of the Spirit to reclaim and restore everything to its rightful state as determined by his character and purposes. That's what God is up to. According to his character, he's the definition of good and what's just and right, and so as accords with his character and his purposes, he's going to right everything. That that doesn't mean he's going to put it in the way in which we, as fallen human beings, think it should be. God is going to order things rightly in accordance with his created purposes. The Bible makes it clear that when God has completed his plan, okay, here's some of the big strokes, the world broken by human sin will be reclaimed and restored. The malevolent, the, the evil spiritual forces will be defeated, restrained, and condemned. All who abandon their rebellion and bow the knee to God's love displayed in Jesus will know everything they were created to enjoy. And then here equally is the teaching of the Bible from Jesus and the Scriptures forward. And everyone who persists in their rebellion will get their wish and be separated from Him, from God, and genuine life forever. Okay? So Scripture deals with the broad strokes, and we're going to try to dig into that. So today, when we come to Thessalonians... We want to talk about what we believe here at Emmanuel, the pastors that are teaching, what we believe is the first move that God will make as he wraps up history and uh, as the precursor to another move called the Day of the Lord. So we want to talk today about the rapture uh, as an entrance to the Day of the Lord. I'm going to explain those to you uh, from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want to talk about how the understanding of the end should affect the way we live today. Now, I always want to make a caution here with you, is uh, I'm going to talk to you about things that are believed by every Bible-believing Christian who follows Jesus, and those are the absolutes. But I'm also going to talk to you about certain convictions that we have that are taught here at EBC that are going to be uh, from the pulpit. Now, on the absolutes, A person who believes, they must believe that Jesus is going to return. If Jesus isn't going to return, it means that resurrection itself wasn't effective and didn't happen, and we're a bunch of sad people gathered here today, right? We're just here telling a nice little story to ourselves that's really not going to impact us at all, and we truly are what many people in the secular world think Christians are. Christians are a group of people who can't face up to the fact that life is fundamentally absurd and meaningless. It just is. And Christians are too weak-minded to hold on to the reality that your life really doesn't mean anything. They're just too weak-minded, right? And so either one, they won't embrace that or they won't go ahead and live uh, kind of meaningfully, whatever that means, in light of that truth. But Christians are someone who have to create a story that makes them feel good about their lives or give purpose to their lives so that they can face the fact that ultimately you don't matter, there's no future for you, and you're just an interesting meatball hurling through space. 
and eventually you're just going to die and nothing's, nobody's going to remember you and eventually even the, the uh, uh, little, uh, uh, if you're, you know, ascribed to getting your name on a bench, right, or your name on a building, eventually you'll be at some place like Cedarville where young people will be coming in, living in the building and not know you and not care. Right? And I'm not talking about the kids are bad. They just don't know the person who was 60 years ago or 70 years ago. Right? And their name is listed there. And eventually somebody else will come on and take your name off and put somebody else's name on. Right? And if that's all that life is, if you want to set in that for a moment, right? you need to set in that for a moment. If that's all that life is, this is why for many people, it's just despair. Right? We live in a moment, and I say this to you from the stats of where we are. Suicide rates are rising dramatically. Among young men, they're off the charts, right? And if you think seriously about life and you think about where you are and you see your life aging, you see yourself as a pariah in society because all men are toxic, you see yourself as these kinds of things you get fretted by, the government's falling apart, crazy things are happening, diseases are out there and so forth and so on. Well, what is there to live for when everything that you really care about has been taken away from you because of the events that are happening? Well, what are you gonna do? Where are you gonna go? Well, you can escape into drugs, you can escape into pornography for men. You can escape into all kinds of things to try to just deal with stuff. But what's the big picture about? Where am I going? Right? So you've got these two visions that are out there. One tries to cl- cover it over with metaphors and things like that. Like we're trying to love Mother Earth. Well, let me tell you, Mother Earth is not Mother. She doesn't care about you. Right? She doesn't care about you. She doesn't feel like you like a mother. You're not her children. There's just this immaterial, there's this material, uh, personality-less stuff out there. And it's not holding you in its bosom, right? And giving you and loving you. All that language is just, is just flowery language of despair. That's trying to give meaning to a meaningless, empty void that you live in. And you happen to be an interesting accident that gets to be here for a blip in time. Right? So the issue that we have here is we want to come, is that really the story? What does God say? How are things going to end, right, in terms of that? We want to listen to him. Okay, so let's come and let's talk here about uh, 1 Thessalonians, and I want you to begin in chapter 5 with me for a moment, and we're going to begin in 5. We're going to back up and catch chapter 4, but I want to talk here a little bit about what's going on. It says, now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. When he's talking about times and dates here, he's talking about the times that God has set to bring his purposes to fruition, right? And so therefore, you need to understand the times, meaning how your present moment fits into God's purposes, right? So the times and dates, I don't need to write to you, uh, we don't need to write, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, as Paul introduces chapter 5, He makes very clear that what he's writing to them is not anything new. That the people he's writing to, they've heard this before, he's covering uh, uh, old territory. But it emphasizes, when you back up to chapter 4, verse 13, it emphasizes that when he, he just spoke about what we often refer to as the rapture, being snatched up or assumed to heaven to be with the Lord, he talks here about that in verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. So what Paul introduces in chapter 4 is something that's in addition to something they already know about the end times. Okay, So it's a new insight that Paul has been given, and he says here, he attributes it to uh, an insight given to him by a word of the Lord. He says in verse 14, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we who are still alive. So here he begins to work into what Paul, as an apostle, has received from Jesus. Now, let me speak to you for a moment about this day of the Lord, and then we'll come back and talk about the relationship of the rapture to it. Now, the day of the Lord is a constant uh, theme as you, a sub-theme as you work through the whole biblical storyline. The day of the Lord is a moment in time in which God will invade history to do two things, to vindicate his people and to judge his enemies. Now, there have been repeated events throughout history where God has invaded to judge, right? One of the days of the Lord that's known in the Old Testament period 
is when the day of the Lord God brought his wrath down on his own people who broke the covenant when they sinned against God and therefore the Babylonians came in and sacked Jerusalem and took the Jews and scattered them throughout their empire. But God protected his remnant. He vindicated his remnant. And one of those remnant people, Jeremiah, was saying, God is standing against you. God calls you to repent. God says that if you don't turn, that they're going to come. And they rejected Jeremiah's word and therefore rejected God. And they went full down the path and God judged them, right? And he judged uh, those who stood against him. Well, there is the day, par excellence, the day of all days when God is going to invade and he's going to bring judgment on his enemies and he's going to bring vindication to his people. Now, turn over to 2 Thessalonians. Many of you could probably stay on the same page. We're in chapter 1. Paul speaks about this period of time, this day of the Lord, in a kind of a summary fashion where he gives us those two basic ideas in chapter 1. Look at verse uh, 6 here. God is just, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to those who are troubled and to us as well. So the two ideas, God is going to make sure that justice ultimately is delivered and that his people ultimately receive everything that he has promised them. And he goes on to say, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people, marvel that among all those who have believed, this includes you because you believed on the testimony of the Lord. So here we're going to delve into everyone believes uh, that as a Christ follower that Christ is returning. Okay, It's an essential teaching in the earliest creeds of the church. It's one of the core teachings of the church. Everyone believed that when Christ returns, he's going to vindicate his people and culminate his promises to them, and he's going to judge his enemies. Everyone agrees on that. Where Christians disagree or have differences of opinion is on how these events unfold. What's the order of these events? How will we experience them? Okay? So this is where we're going to delve into, and I'm going to give you a particular approach to them that I believe uh, is the teaching of Scripture, and we believe it, Emmanuel, and give it to you. And we'll talk about the order of these events. This is not absolutely crucial to know the order, but there is important teaching, as there is in all Scripture, for how it orients to our lives today. Okay? Am I going in and out up here? Okay. Um, I feel like I'm dropping in and out, and I'm, I'm yelling. Uh, okay. So, what I want to talk to you here about this. So, let me move up a little bit further. Okay. Making sure I'm here. So, the topic here is the stance fitting those who look toward and forward to the Lord's day, okay? Now, what I'm going to present to you here is something that's often referred to as a pre-tribulational rapture view, right? So I'll throw out those $64,000 words, right? All it means is that we believe 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, is an event that's going to precede the time of God's judgment, which is the time of tribulation. So the rapture occurs before, pre, the tribulation. Okay? So, and we believe that this text teaches it. We believe that the biblical storyline leads us to exper- express that. Next week when we come back, we're going to talk about this particular period, the tribulation era itself, where we'll draw more of the threads together with regards to that. But here we're referring to an event, the rapture, that occurs before uh, the the judgment that is going to ensue in the day of the Lord. So you see it there. We live in this moment where God is building his church, as Jesus said, and then we wait for him to come for his people to assume us to heaven, right, which is in 1 Thessalonians 4, and, then, and that will ensue uh, thereafter, a time of judgment on the nations that will culminate in Christ's coming uh, to establish his millennial kingdom. So the day of the Lord, if you see here, is not a day. It's not the Lord's day. It's not a 24-hour period. It's a period of time that encompasses a whole uh, group of events where God will bring judgment and vindication uh, for his people. So Paul is building here on what has been taught elsewhere. And as we look at the argument throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians, I just want to give you some basic reasons here 
for why I see the, tribula- the rapture occurring before the tribulation. Okay? Now I want you to look back in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, and if you don't have your Bibles, you can see the verse up on the screen. Here's where Paul is describing uh, the conversion of the believers at Thessalonica. Here's a couple things that you find from 1 Thessalonians that lead us to think that Christians will not experience this outpouring of wrath. And I want to suggest to you that the scriptures speak of a time to come that will be unparalleled to any times that have ever been. Okay? And when you know, if you have any knowledge of world history, that should make you inhale a little bit. Okay? So here's some things here. And one starts back in 110. He describes them coming to Christ in chapter 1. He says, Therefore we do not need to say anything at the end of verse 8, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell you... They tell how you turn from God, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay. Now here, what he says is that it's something that is yet future. So Jesus is coming to deliver us from the coming wrath. It doesn't say that Jesus is going to protect us through the coming wrath. It says that he's going to deliver us from the wrath. And so also, it's not something that we're experiencing in the presence. It's something that we have yet to experience. Okay? The Thessalonians that he's writing to are going through terrible persecution. They have come to believe in Christ. They left. They had been following Judaism. They left Judaism to embrace Jesus, the Messiah. They had already left their polytheistic religions to come toward Judaism. Now they're a small group of people that are hated by everybody else in their town. Right? So they're experiencing such difficulty that Paul equates their persecution in chapter 2 with the kind of persecution that the early Christian martyrs experienced in Jerusalem when Stephen was killed. So he's saying that wrath, the time of the outpouring of God's wrath, that's something that's coming, that's associated, and God and Christ is going to deliver us from that. Right? Then back in our passage, come to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. We'll come to this in a moment. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So within the text itself, uh, there are indications that this wrath is something that we won't experience. Now, I want to qualify this and make it very clear Paul, it's a given that you're going to experience difficulty for following Jesus, right? Jesus guarantees that you will make it to the kingdom if you've believed in him, but he doesn't guarantee that you won't be martyred on the way. He doesn't guarantee that you won't have cancer. He doesn't guarantee that you won't have a life-altering illness. He doesn't guarantee that everyone will love you. Matter of fact, he says, the more you behave like me, the more you'll be treated like me, right? So what I'm not saying here is that there's a time coming where Christians can expect difficulty and today we don't, no. I'm talking about a time that Scripture talks about that is so unparalleled that it looks like nothing that has ever been. Okay? Matter of fact, let me just give you a word from Jesus, the passage we're going to be in next week, Mark chapter 13 and verse 9. He speaks about this period of time. He says, because those days will be of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Okay. Now, as we come to that period of time, it's something unparalleled that awaits out in the future. So God tells us on the wrong side of Jesus is a time that you don't want to see. Right? But he promises to deliver his people from that. So this is why when we back up to chapter 4, right, what is the fate of sleeping believers, right, in chapter 4, 13, Paul wants to go and develop this idea, right, that's rooted in the death of Jesus, Christ's work made possible the promises of the future resurrection for believers, right? For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him, right? So there's going to be a resurrection of all the believers in Christ, who've fallen asleep as followers of Christ, who are going to be resurrected to meet him in the air and be assumed into heaven with him. And then he goes on to say, here, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and that we who are still alive and are left 
will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the resurrection of Christ makes possible and guarantees the promise of the future that dead loved ones will not miss out on any of Christ's culminating triumph because they will be resurrected. And then their deliverance from the coming wrath and their welcome into the presence of the Lord is secure. So he ends with this thought. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Okay? So here he doesn't say we'll immediately come back down to the earth and do certain things. He talks about we'll be assumed into the presence of the Lord and all of those things come with being with Christ, right? A wash in God's love and bursting with love. Faith becomes and stays sight, right? Say goodbye to death, decay, and suffering. The end of restless stirring. All things are new. Deep, satisfying, all-pervasive joy, right? No more aching absences with the people that we love. All of that Jesus holds out to us when he comes to reclaim his people. Okay. So as we look at 4, 13 to 18, he tells us that I'm coming, right? There's a, uh, an ancient African-American spiritual called the Great Getting Up Morning, right? Well, Bob Colliner's in here. I know he's directed choirs to sing that. In the Great Getting Up Morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. In the Great Getting Up Morning, fare thee well, fare thee well. But most people don't read the whole song. The song starts, one of the main standards talks about how God is going to reclaim his people and bring them into everything that they long for. The other one warns the listeners of the judgment of the weights of those who have rejected the Lord. Right? The great getting up morning. Now, as we turn to chapter 5 here in our section here, now he wants to say, given the fact that we know that Christ will deliver us and bring us to himself, now we want to look at this day of the Lord and we want to talk about what kind of lives should we live today? What kind of attitude should we have today, right? Now, I'm speaking into you as believers right here and now that often, I know I've said this to you before, but when I was in college and people would talk about the second coming of Christ, my basic attitude was, I'm really glad he's coming back. I don't want to think too deeply about that because I got things to do before he comes. I just really was. Okay, I, you know, one, I'd like to get married. I like to start a family, and what it, what it really revealed to me is I had such vulgar conceptions of heaven that I thought it's a great retirement program, right? Like, God, when I'm 85 and I can't walk around anymore, right, and Ron is tired of caring for me, right? I'm 85 and she won't push me in my wheelchair anymore, right? She's leaving me set somewhere out all day, okay? So when that happens, okay, God, take me up, right? Take me up, right? And that's such antithetical to the biblical storyline. One of the things that happens to you in salvation Right, and the same thing, as you get closer to Christ, a natural thing happens, you yearn to be with him. And that's why the, ch the prayers of the church is, come Lord Jesus. And, and one of the, uh, the indicators of our tepid relationship with Jesus is the fact that we don't yearn to be with him. So, so Paul, if you would ask Paul, he said, if I'd had my druthers today, uh, would I stay here for your benefit or be with Christ, which is better by far? Well, if I had my druthers, okay, the better by far, but okay, I'm going to take the lesser for myself for your best, right? And I, I, have to, I say this to you that many of us, we have to reckon with the idea that the whole storyline, if Jesus doesn't come back, we're a sad group of people. This is a core teaching, right? And if he doesn't come back, we should just go do something else because we're not going to deliver the world through our political activity, you're not going to raise a generation of perfect children who are going to redeem everything. You're going to die one day. A hundred years from now, nobody in this room will be alive. Is that it? Is that the story, right? And so Jesus' promise to come back needs to shape every way we think about our lives. It needs to shape our endurance and everyday difficulties, right? So we want to come to that here. And so as he goes after it, and he talks about these issues, right, with the day of the Lord... Uh, he's going to talk about in chapter 5, verse 3, the attitude of people who don't believe Christ is coming. So he says this, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on pregnant women, and they will not escape, right? Now, you can't see this, so the, the couple things here, let me come back here, is he says here a couple things is that people who don't believe in the, in, in the Christ, he uses a metaphor of stupor, of drunkenness. They're in a moral stupor, right? So the issue here is, uh, I can't even read my own thing here, right? 
So they go around and think that they can either bring in peace or safety or they say that peace or safety is on the cusp, right? How many people have you heard in this contemporary political season promise that if we just had these people in office, if we just had these pieces of legislation guiding us, we could bring justice to the world, right? And across peace and safety, peace and safety. If we get rid of the police, we'd have peace and safety. If we keep the police, we have peace and safety, Right? All these type of things. And people run, in the ancient uh, Roman world, this was what people would run around saying, because of Rome and its power and might, we've brought in peace, human flourishing, and we have complete safety because no one could ever thwart our power. And so people who don't believe in, in Christ, they walk around in a moral stupor. They're not aware to the danger of their moment and the potential of their moment. Right? And they think they can conquer the challenges in front of them, or at least they ignore them and live in ignorance of them. And the other thing about here is they'll be surprised. He says here in chapter 5, verse 3, they'll be overtaken, right? He says here, while they cry peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on pregnant women, right? It's going to happen, right? And so Christians sound today, think about this, Christians, you sound today like Noah did in the flood. Like Noah did in the flood, right? Noah's going there saying, hey, hey there's a big storm coming. There's a big storm coming, and if you don't turn to God, you need to turn to God, and here is the safety. This is the boat. Peter actually uses, 2 Peter uses this illustration of the need in light of Christ's coming that we need to get in a boat. Well, what is the boat? It's Jesus. How are you going to get through this judgment that's coming? Well, for Jesus, right? So he uses that illustration to get here, and so you're living ignorant of the moment, right? And the way we live ignorant in the moment right now is just thinking of Bill Maher's uh, little commentary, his little uh, mockumentary where it called religious, where he mocks Christians and they're, they're looking forward to the return of Christ. I think of our culture that uses hell as just a cursed word to mock its reality. Hell this, hell this, hell that, right? Because I don't believe there's a hell. I don't believe there's a judgment. Where they say, damn you, damn this. Why? Because I don't believe there's going to be anybody damned. And so I just say damn, meaning I don't like you, right? And that's where we live in a culture. We get, we get kind of marinated in it. And we get uh, used to it, and all the while they're mocking realities that Christ is coming, that judgment is awaiting, that reward is out there, and people live, and they mock, they live in a moral stupor, right, to that. That's what he says. Now, when he moves on to the next section, he says, contrary to that, people who believe in the day of the Lord, they're sober and aware. He says, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, so that this day will surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day who do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the faith and love as a breastplate and a hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him, right? So we as believers, we're sober and aware of the times that we live in, right? Of its challenges and its opportunities that we have in this moment, right? It should be, right, for every one of us who has someone who does not know Christ that's in our sphere of influence. That sober reality should inform the way you pray for them and that you do pray for them. It should inform every conversation you have with them. It should weight your relationship. And as Lewis has often remarked, C.S. Lewis, in his little essay, The Weight of Glory, you are living and rubbing shoulders with immortals every day. Right? So it should, it, should, it should enliven the prayers of every Sunday school teacher. It should enliven the prayers of every worship team member. It should enliven the prayers of everyone who works behind the scenes. It should, this is here, this is God working out his saving purposes, bringing people to life, rescuing them from judgment, saving them and drawing them into life. We're not here gathering together, putting on programs and putting chairs out. There's a weightiness. It should, it should affect the way you talk afterwards. We should be checking on the people. We should know every person in our sphere of influence, where do you stand with Jesus? God forgive us if we have people that we've talked to for years and years and we don't know where they stand with Jesus, right? So if we believe that, there should be a sobriety about us, right? And I know for many of us there are. There are people that we yearn for to come to Christ. We're weeping over. We're praying for day in and day out. Please, God, let them open their heart and and put down their rebellion. 
right? So the idea, it's a soberness here. And, and we're firmly rooted in where peace and safety belong. Peace and safety, right? There's wise things to talk about with regards to the election that's coming up. There's all kinds of things to act Christianly here. We'll talk about some of those in the future. There's all kinds of wise things to do. But I'm not looking to America for peace and safety, the ultimate peace and safety. I'm not looking to any particular ruler. I'm not looking to any particular person. I don't entrust my full well-being and health to my wife. If I put that on her, that's a load that she cannot bear. Right? So I'm, I'm looking to Christ in this moment and I'm anticipating nothing in this life will ultimately satisfy me. Not the best job, not the most beautiful woman or, or most handsome man, not the most viral moment, not the most popularity. That's not going to give you deep flourishing and real sense of security and well-being. The only thing that's going to provide that is Jesus. And every time you get caught up, Letting the culture tell you where peace and safety lie is you're just heading right to destruction, right, with the rest of them who don't know the nature of the times in which we live, okay? So there's a way to that. And then the issue here that life is under control of Christ and his promise to deliver us from wrath, right? It's under him, right? And so this, so many different things that will impact us as we think about this. And as I come up, I just want to give you so uh, if you're writing here, four things that we do then, okay, just four things, right? And we use them here, four. One, we're not drunk, okay? I don't mean literally drunk, but if it applies, literally drunk, we're not drunk, okay? And here, we don't buy into those who claim that they have found security in the best of life through fame, money, sex, or power. We don't believe it. We don't believe that fame, money, sex, or power we're not drunk on that. We don't think that that's where life is to be found, right? And we don't entrust ourselves to messiahs. We don't treat any politician or any leader as a messiah, right? So I don't care if it's a, po a, po a political leader, if it's an artistic figure, or if it's an athletic figure, right? God forgive us for, for entrusting ourselves to people and their visions, okay? So one, we're not drunk. Two, we're sober, okay? We believe the promises of God, and that grounds us. The reason today that I'm not in despair is because I know Jesus is coming, right? Well, no, not because the people around me are perfect, not because things are going great all the time, not because my health is perfect, right, or that I think I can get it. I believe that Jesus is coming. I believe that he's going to right all things. The reason why I don't give up when injustice is there, and I want to work for it to the degree that I can contribute to it, but I know that ultimately there will be a day when all accounts are settled, Right? There's not a person, if somebody has injured you deeply, if somebody abused you and they've gotten away with it, they haven't gotten away with anything. There's a day of reckoning coming. Okay? There's a deep need for justice in us and God will bring justice. And only those who have repented of their sin, who deserve God's justice, who've thrown themselves on God's mercy, are not going to get to experience that justice. Because Jesus takes it for us. Okay? So we're sober about that. We believe we're awake to the nature of this moment. We're not uh, fiddling our, our way through the day. We're not wasting our lives. I say this to you young people, right, is, is one of the things that's conditional. People grow up slower and slower, right? I tell this sometimes to my students, right? It's time to grow up. I don't care if you're 19 or 18 or 16. It's time to grow up. There's a mission out there. There's things to live for. You don't want to waste your life. Choose, choose sides while you're young, don't let say, well, that's adulting. No, no, no. Step into maturity. I don't care what age you are. Step into it. There, there are souls that need to hear about Christ. There is a mission to be on. There are threats to your well-being as a Christian. You don't need to be in a place where you're just letting mom or dad or the adults carry the weight of what it means to follow Jesus. Get up there and go after it, right? Don't waste your youth. Don't get sucked into the world around you, right? So we're sober. But we're relieved, this is the third thing, we're relieved and excited, right? We're relieved and excited. I'm looking forward to, and the older I grow in Christ, right? And I become aware, right? I'm, I'm, I'm in my sixth right, decade, right? Younger than some of you and older than most of you, right? So it was hard for me when I hit 60. 50 didn't bother me. 60 somehow bothered me. And my family had the audacity to celebrate it, right? Uh, and I thought, I don't want to celebrate that. Had a whole bunch of people over there telling me, you're 60. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the, that moment, right? 
But the idea is here, I'm relieved to know ultimately that, that I, I, as I see myself getting older, things don't work the same. I don't have the same energy I used to have, right? I have a different outlook on life. I'm relieved and excited that, that the diminishing faculties that I have as I grow older, that's not the final word on Greg Kowser. That's not the final word. I'm not living a purpose, purposeless life that's just going to wind up in a grave as a hunk of dirt. Now I have a father who loves me and a savior who's going to reclaim me and I will get to see uh, faith will become sight when we get to see him. And I'm believing the scriptural vision is what I desperately long for is not some mansion, not some particular landscape. What I desperately long for is the voice of Christ speaking into me, you well done my good and faithful servant. That's the deepest yearning of my heart that drives my desire for significance and fame and praise from other people. Why? Because I need to hear it from him. One day I'll get to see it face to face. So I'm relieved by that. Right? So Christians should be people. We grieve, but we grieve with hope. We're concerned for people, but we don't fret and anxious because we're relieved and excited. And then finally, we remind each other. We're reminders. Okay? Okay? This is where Paul ends here, and there's so many things here. We just remind each other every day. If you're single, right, life isn't found and life isn't kept from you until you find a him or her, that you have everything that you need. What you need to do is to live into Christ, cry out to him for the things that you long for, but a person is not the key to your happiness. Christ is the key to your happiness. When you're right with him, then if it's his grace and his goodness and it's best for you, then he'll bring somebody into your life to share that. Not to make you happy as if he is insufficient, but to share that with, with them and to enjoy it together. So we remind each other, right, that no person or thing can bring genuine peace we need to remind that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. If you're in a place where you're really hurting today, you need to be reminded that you can't be separated from the love of Christ. And here, let me tell you this, that we need to be reminded that anything that we go through today, and there are people who are suffering here today, any disease, any marital conflict, any relational stress, any difficulties that you're facing, any mental illness that you're facing, in light of everything that God holds out for us, Paul has the audacity to say in Romans chapter 5 that they are light and momentary afflictions. You hear me? Light and momentary afflictions. That only makes sense if there is a never-ending bliss that waits out in the future, that when you look back on our moment, whatever you're enduring to love your husband, whatever you're enduring to go after your kids who are lost, whatever you're enduring in mockery and shame, whatever physical ailment that you're suffering from, whatever thing that you're going through, it's a light and momentary affliction. Life is short. Eternity is forever. Right? Short. So we, we tell each other, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to hold on with you. I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to hold you. Hold on. Don't abandon Jesus. There's no path anywhere else. Struggling with your sexuality, hold on. Struggling with addiction, hold on. Struggling in your marriage, hold on. Hold on. Let's hold on, right? By God's grace. He's coming. If he isn't coming, there's no hope. He's coming. And why do I say he's coming? Because he's been faithful to do everything he's ever said he's going to do. Right? An empty tomb says there's going to be a coming Savior, right? A cross and an empty tomb, there's a coming Savior, right? So praise God for that. Pray with me, would you, as we go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for all that you've given us. Lord, we are grateful for your many, many, many kindnesses to us. Lord, it's just uh, hard to imagine the creator of the world, the one who gave existence to everything Lord, and brought us into a unique relationship with you. And Lord, we had the audacity, Lord, to spurn you, to turn from you. And Lord, you came after us. And Lord, you, 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 in your great patience, you were slow to anger and rich in mercy. And so Lord, over the ages, you have put in, in motion a plan to reclaim and restore everything. 
And Lord, you even give us an insight into the final chapter. Lord, what you're going to do, and you're going to come for your people, and you're going to take those that you've called out, and you're going to bring them to yourself. Lord, you are going to bring justice because you are a just God. And so, Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray that you would deepen our gratefulness for the rescue that we have in Christ. You would humble us, Lord, because we we didn't deserve anything. You just graciously grabbed us and brought us to yourself. Lord, please help us not to be drunk, Lord, to the moment. Lord, help us to be sober and aware. Give weight to our lives, Lord. Give weight to our joy, our security. Lord, give weight to our service. Lord, please, Lord, we don't want to just stumble around, Lord, in anticipation of your coming. Lord, I pray today, if there's anyone in here today who does not know you today, Lord, you offer the only safe way, Lord, to to move into the future with joy, blessing, Lord, by believing on Jesus Christ. I pray today, Lord, would you bring them to you? Lord, I pray that they would open their hearts and call out to you. For every one of us as followers of Christ who have known the grace of Christ, but our lives look like we're drunk, Lord, forgive us. Lord, give us weight. Lord, give us perspective. So we pray this in the name of Jesus. We ask you in his name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day today.